and thank you for tuning in to Starting Small. Today, I'm joined by Mike McFall of Big B Coffee. Mike, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, my pleasure, Cameron. Great to be here. Yeah. So if you wouldn't mind, I would love to start out with your upbringing. Uh, where did you grow up and what would you say your childhood was like? Well, I, I grew up just north of here. I'm in Ann Arbor. I live in Ann Arbor now and I grew up about a half hour north of her, here. You know, when I grew up, it was a it was definitely a bedroom community of uh, Detroit, but uh, yeah. you know it's now become more more of a suburb of Detroit now. But it was it was pretty rural when when I was growing up, um, yeah. and uh, you know I I would put my childhood sort of in the idyllic category. Uh, you know, I have two loving, adoring parents that supported me, <laughs> and yeah. my, I have two brothers supported the three of us, and and you know just living an amazing amazing life as kids and yeah. and uh, doing our thing. So you know. Um, school wasn't my specialty, uh, that, that, uh, you know, I, I, I found it to be, uh, pretty rude and yeah. pretty boring, you know? And, uh, so I did, I wasn't, I didn't excel as a student by any stretch. Um, but you know, that being said, my mom always, I always talked about that, you know, when I wanted to do something, it was like, you couldn't get in the way of me. I, you know, I was yeah. going to do it and, uh, school just wasn't that thing for me. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I'd love to hear like what were some of your interests you'd say if you wasn't really in school was it athletics or what what would you say that was? You know, it would be athletics. Uh it could be spending, you know, 13 hours a day for four straight days building a tree fort, you know, in the woods yeah. behind your house or you know, uh playing baseball with my friends in the in the field or you know, but but you know, as I got a little older, it it definitely became more organized athletics. Uh yeah. hockey was just a huge part of my life growing up and, mm -hmm. and you know, I if it was, if I, if I had, if I had a skate that day, you know, I couldn't sit still, you know, I was so excited. Yeah. Didn't matter if it was a practice or a game or whatever. And, yeah. uh, but you know, I really, I was very social too. Like mm -hmm. I just, you know, I loved hanging out with my friends and, for sure. but, you know, when you, you kind of look at the sort of Norman Rockwell type childhood, uh, that, that was, that was kind of our gig growing up. Yeah. We, we lived on a small little lake and caught turtles and went fishing and <laughs> yeah, know. a lot. But, all the stuff that seems to be um, uh, gone in, in, in today's childhoods, you know? It's, yeah. I'd love yeah. to have my kids out trying to catch frogs. and. <laughs> so I saw you went on to study at Kalamazoo. If you can kind of describe this transition in your life, um, what and what made you end up staying in Michigan for school? And then also, what did you study? Well, I, you know, the, the story on Kalamazoo College is, you know, Kalamazoo uh, – was 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 actually a pretty competitive school and and I didn't have the grades to get in uh, yeah. and, but I had my junior year of high school I had gone on a a trip on a on a um, square rig barkentine tall ship it was a sailing ship and we sailed from Canada to Singapore and yeah. it, Kalamazoo College is a unique place uh, and so you know that was something that I think caught their eye and yeah. when I went and met with the admissions group they basically gave me some criteria. Like they said, Hey, we, we want you to, you know, if you can get this grade point average through your senior year, which I think was like a three, five throughout my mm -hmm. senior year. And then certain certain test scores, uh, then they would sort of ignore everything in my freshman and sophomore year and then yeah. just, you know, bring me in. And so I did, I did that. Um, and I was able to get in, but what I found was, is I was really ill-prepared. <laughs> Yeah. You know, and so school, college, once I was in, once I was in school, um, you know, and I love the place, right? I, I really did enjoy the, the atmosphere there. And um, my mom had a dear friend who was a, he, he worked with um, high profile athletes, okay. placing them in the right situations. He was like a consultant yeah. and, and I wasn't a high profile athlete. I was just a, a friend of his kid, but he, he sat down with me and interviewed me and, and basically said to me, Hey, I think there's one school anywhere for you. And that's, uh, that's Kalamazoo college. And so that's how I ended up there. Um, I did, yeah. you know, I did have to work probably a little harder than most, uh, to yeah. get by because I just was pretty far behind. Uh, mm -hmm. and, but all in all, uh, Kalamazoo was a great choice for me. Um, yeah. met a lot of amazing people and really enjoyed my time. Yeah. So, uh, when you were with your time at Kalamazoo college, what would you say was, uh, really taking your time? What were your, some of your, inter <laughs> um, your interests at that time? What did you study? Any, extracurriculars what was that like well I, I played on a golf team uh okay. and you know so but that wasn't a huge commitment I mean it was division three golf and yeah and, you know, I tell people my high school golf team probably could have beaten my college golf team so it was 
it wasn't competitive, uh, yeah. super competitive, but it was really fun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, I still to this day have, have good, very good friends of mine that I play golf with. And, and so that was a, that was, a, but that was, from a time perspective, that was a pretty small piece. Yeah. Um, I also, but I worked at a retail store in Kalamazoo called golf and hockey services. And mm-hmm. it was a golf store in the summer. And I worked in the hockey store in the winter and it, these were like my people, yeah. you know, I mean, I was a golfer, a big golfer, love golf and, Hockey was my passion. So I worked there, you know, I think for five years uh, and mm-hmm. love those guys and learned yeah. it. On. I, 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 I'm I, still friends with them. In fact, I was just talking to one of the owners the other day, you know, 30 some years later. Wow. And uh, I, was, I was, we were reminiscing a little bit. And I told him, I said, you know, I think I learned more working for you guys than I did going to school at Kalamazoo College. Yeah. You know, just the, sure. the practical nuts and bolts of retail. Um, yeah how to run a, a great retail store because mm. they're they're very very good at what they do and so that took a ton of my time i mean i probably i was very fortunate because i didn't have to work you know i mean my parents were paying for my college which i'll be forever grateful uh for that yeah. uh but i didn't have to work but i probably i probably worked 25 or 30 hours a week at the store just because i i loved it i love being there and yeah you know, nothing, nothing more fun than suiting up a five-year-old for his first set of hockey gear you know and and yeah. uh, that that's that's a great that's a great experience so uh, that that took i would say that probably took up the majority of my time uh, yeah other, sure. than, other than you know studying yep so uh post-graduation then uh what did this journey look like for you you, you didn't go straight into big b at this time i know you were a barista at the number one store what was that next career step after graduating i took a straight commission sales job okay and and whenever I have the opportunity to talk to anybody about entrepreneurship, you know, they'll yeah. ask me, so how can I prepare? How can I prepare to become an entrepreneur? Mm-hmm. And, and I, and I tell them two things. I tell them one, go to your, go to your local community college and take a class in bookkeeping. Mm. Uh, keep your money organized. That's all you got to do. <laughs> yeah. You know, in startup, it's not about high finance, right? It is about yeah. keeping your money organized, know how much money you have, where you're spending it and so on. And And then the other thing I tell them is, get a straight commission sales job mm. because to me, there's no better corollary in the world yeah. than straight commission. You wake up in the morning, you sell product, you make money. If you wake up in the morning and you don't sell product, you don't make money. And, yeah. and that that's entrepreneurship. If you don't, if you don't figure out how to move product in the world, you got nothing. And yeah. so that I did that for about two years. It was a cool experience. Uh, mm. I, I learned a ton. I worked hard, uh, did really well in that. Um, uh, but but then I I didn't enjoy Texas so much. That's where my my territory was. Yeah. And uh, and then I moved I moved back home and took a job with a Fortune 500 company. I lasted nine months. I got mm. fired from I got fired from that job. Uh, wow. And yeah, miserable culture, terrible culture. Uh, yeah. You know, and and I was immature and young too. I did dumb stuff. <laughs> you know, so it, it wasn't I it wasn't on the company that I got fired. I mean, I was dumb, uh, but getting fired was the best thing in the world because that yeah. allowed me to advance into um, I, how I ended up in East Lansing, uh, which was where the first store was located. Yep. I, I took a research job at the university. My mom was a teacher at Michigan State University okay. and one of her colleagues, she and one of her colleagues worked on this like decade long research project. Mm. And they, and, and so he hired me to come in and help him with, you know, a lot of the data stuff. And, and so I took that job and then uh, I just went to every coffee shop in East Lansing and applied mm-hmm. because the, the research job was only 20 hours a week. And so I had all this extra time. And so I ended up walking into the first Big B store. We only, they don't, we only have one store at that point. Yeah. And I applied uh, and, you know, luckily uh, Mary Roselle hired me uh, and I started as a barista there. I worked 6 a.m. till 2 p.m. Monday through Friday at mm-hmm. that coffee shop. And, and then I'd walk over to the university, which is just across the street. And yep. I would work, you know, two 30 to six 30, you know, on the research project. And then I would go hang out with my friends. Wow. That's incredible. So if you can explain to the listeners, I know we had uh, the founder of Kodiak cakes. He, uh, he joined when they were just launching. So he's considered a co-founder, but can you explain also this process as you joined as an employee, but are also considered a, co- a co-founder this time, you're part of the founding team. So if you can explain yeah. that. Yeah. So, so my partners, Bob Fish and Mary Roselle, they started the first store Yep. and I was an employee of that store. Um, they then built the second store uh, and I became the manager of that second store. Mm-hmm. 
what went down though was Bob, I didn't know Bob because he worked the 3 p.m. till close shift. Uh, and yeah. I worked with Mary every morning. So, so Mary recommended to Bob that he talk to me or interview me about becoming a manager because they were opening the second store. Yep. So Bob and I uh, sat down. It was this beautiful spring morning in March of 1997. Mm-hmm. And we sat down and uh, we ended up popping up and going for a walk instead of sitting sort of interview style. Yeah. Well, four and a half hours later, we shook hands at the back in the back of the parking lot of that store and agreed to start a company uh, that we would utilize to, to develop the brand. Uh, Baby yep. Coffee. And wow. so uh, that that company, Global Orange Development, that's mm-hmm. the franchisor for Big B Coffee. Got it. Uh, and it's the it's what we own. Uh, Bob Bob and Mary sold the stores that they owned uh, to a franchisee, uh, you know, pretty early on, and and then so I I did co-found the franchising company uh, for Big B Coffee uh, with Bob and Mary. We were all you know at that point we were partners, one third, one third, one third, and yep. then we we uh, we bought Mary out in two thousand and twelve. And so since 2012, it's just, it's been Bob and I. Yep. Amazing. So what was that first expansion like for you, for your, your founding team, especially getting that first, that next door and then expanding into 10 to 20. What was that process like seeing just that after being a part of store one? Well, you know, you're just doing it, you know, you're doing whatever it takes at that point. And, and so, you know, we were, we had, we had two stores that, you know, what we owned, which, you know, actually Bob and Mary owned them. I, I didn't own those, but, you yeah. know, we were, we were running those and we were trying to, you know, and the thing, the thing was, is when Bob and I shook hands, we didn't know what that was going to look like. We yeah. hadn't decided to franchise at that point. Yeah. And, uh, and so we locked in on franchising in, you know, sometime probably June, July, August of that year, we spent about six months getting everything organized and ready for franchising. And then yeah. we launched the franchise in January of 90, 1999. Got it. I think, no, maybe 98. Anyway. And so, but, but I'll tell you like so much of that, that time, it was very exciting. You know, yeah. uh, you're just, you're just in it, you're doing it, uh, just trying to grow, trying to do the best job you can and really just obsessing over revenue. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> just trying to generate revenue, you know, and and so I look back on that time very fondly. Um, I had I had a lot to learn, you know. I'd never been in food service before, and yep. so I spent you know I spent a decade just learning and learning and learning, and mm-hmm. and uh, and you know, it's been such a slow progression. It yeah. really has. I mean, we've been at it twenty seven years, and and yeah. so it's been a, it's been a slow progression, and so you know, we always wanted it to be going faster. Yeah. We always wanted to be growing more, right? And, yeah. and you know, um, but you know, when you look back at e- sort of at each stage, you know, you look back, it's like, wow, you know, we're doing okay, yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, and and you know, today even that, you know, you look back and it's like, yeah, you know, it's cool, like what we've done, and but, yeah. but it's not like I'm like, wow, what we did was amazing. I mean, it's 27 years. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you know, but but uh, right now we've got a great company, uh, you know, on our hands, a great team, and and uh, you know things are things are uh, things are great. Mm. I would love to hear what do you think was uh, some vital pieces, especially in those early years, that made up for some of the demand that Big B caught in. Um, was it the flavor options? Was it the efficiency and the speed of your service? What would you say? Kind of, I'm sure it all grew. Well, I think there were there were really two things. Um, yeah. One. You, you know, you have to go back pre Big B. Yeah. And our history and our roots are Bob and Mary owned a high volume breakfast restaurant. Yep. That restaurant when and high volume, I mean it it was crazy. I mean, they they would do, you know, six to eight thousand dollars before noon. Wow. In plates of eggs and pancakes selling for two ninety nine a plate. You know, <laughs> and and so you're talking about plates just flying out of this kitchen. Well, Bob really brought this mentality of running high volume kitchen mm. into the coffee industry. Yep. And, and we set up our espresso bar and it's still set up like that today, mm. like, like a line co- cook process, like a high volume kitchen. Yep. And, and so we were able to operate more effectively, more efficiently with less people on mm. uh, because of that organizational structure. Yep. And, I, and I believe that that was, that was, you know, 
if not the most important, you know, top three things that we did. The other yeah. thing that we, we understood very early on, you know, and very early is like <laughs> the first four years or five years, you know, it's not like yeah. the first four months, but, you know, we, we, yeah. we understood pretty early on that we were in the business of selling what, what we, what we now call sweet bomb lattes. Mm. And, and, you know, that's internal jargon for a latte with caramel and chocolate and whipped cream and sprinkles, you know, that yeah. that's what people were buying. Mm. And, and, and so we realized pretty quickly that that was our core product. Mm. These flavored lattes with whipped cream, that's what people wanted from us. Yep. So many other coffee shops stayed in this mentality of being Italian style espresso bars, serving macchiatos and companas. And, and you know, they left cappuccino on, on the very top portion of the left menu board. Nobody wanted to buy that stuff yep. back in the 90s, right? No one yep. was buying that stuff. So what we did is, we took the sweet bomb latte page with the, the caramel Marvel and the, you know, we used to have a drink called the cherry. O. uh, mm. you know, uh, the, all these really great drinks. Yeah. Basically what well, uh, parties in a cup, these, these great drinks. And we moved that on your board to the left side. And, and that was the focus of, of what we were selling and what mm. we wanted to sell. And so that understanding was, was huge. Yeah. But also it wasn't rocket science. I mean, you yeah. look down at a sales report and it's like, oh, we sold, you know, 312 flavored lattes today and we sold nine cappuccinos. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> like it's not rocket science, you know, but yeah. but uh other other so many other concepts just never sort of lined up with that in the marketplace. Mm. We did. Mm. And we yeah. just started selling flavored lattes. But, and that's wow. what we do. Still what we do today. It's incredible. Um, I would love to hear. Um, I'm sure it's changed over time. But what would you say is kind of like that? What region performs, especially for Big V? I'm, I'm sure it's very diverse or hard to find that. But what is the best performing like region in the Midwest, would you say? Well, you know, our, our home market was, you know, we, we that was, that was kind of I call that kind of hand to hand combat. We we yeah. built Lansing, and but that was we were there, we were in it, we were doing it, we were on top of every little detail. And yeah. but then we made a move to Kalamazoo and Grand Rapids. Yeah, at about the same time, and it took a long time. It took you know years. Mm -hmm. um, but once those markets really started uh, working. And, yeah. and we started building a lot of stores there. That's when the brand became, I would say, sort of, um, you know, much more legitimate. Yeah. And so, you know, and still to this day, West Michigan, uh, Grand Rapids, Kalamazoo, they're, mm -hmm. they're just, they're just, oh my gosh, they're mm -hmm. so, they're so strong for us. And, yeah. and, uh, and so, but now like here we are today, sitting here today and like the Cincinnati market mm -hmm. is is capturing that same kind of energy yeah. that Kalamazoo and Grand Rapids did. What would that have been, you know, 20 years ago? Wow. <laughs> and, or you know, maybe, maybe a little less than that, but, but so, so now it's like, but we've been through it mm. enough times to understand that there's a cycle. Yeah. There's a timeline, you know, you don't walk into a marketplace with a new brand and have performance in the first 24 to 36 months. For sure. Yeah takes, you know, it's five years, seven years. And then, but I'll tell you what, once you get that momentum, mm. that traction in a market, all of a sudden it just starts to happen. Yeah. And, and that's, what's happening for us in, you know, in Cincinnati and there's, there's, you know, we're doing really well in Wisconsin right now. Mm. And, and so, you know, it's just this long, slow process Yeah, and, you know, um, I think one of the things that people struggle with is that patience. Yeah. You start a business and they have this expectation that the thing's going to, going to perform relatively quickly. Mm -hmm. And I, and I write that, I write about that in, in, in my first book grind. And mm -hmm. it's like, that gets a lot of people in trouble. Yeah. You know, Gary, v? you know, Gary. V. Yeah, of course. Yeah. 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 So Gary, yeah. he's got this amazing clip where he talks about speed. Is yep. the devil. 
And it's a powerful clip. And I, and I just, I listened to it one time. And I was like, Oh, I couldn't agree more mm-hmm. because that expectation for speed yeah. gets people in trouble because then when it doesn't happen that quickly, yeah. then they become, then they become uh, disappointed then they become disengaged because of the disappointment. And then the business just starts to crater. Exactly. Yep. I would love to hear um, product development, especially in franchising. So say a franchisee has a new idea. Um, what is corporate's openness to taking on new products or new flavors? And also, what does that look like? Does it start from the corporate side, product development? Where does that feedback start from? Well, I don't want to give you a, a really boring answer here, but it's it's a yep. mix. Of course. It's a mix. And so we have a team, you know, internally. Yep. Um you know, the, the franchisees bring us great stuff all the time. And, yeah. you know, some of the, some of the better products that we've, that we've brought to the market have been from franchise owners and, and actually, you know, from baristas, really. I mean, if you start uh, at the core, that franchise owner probably got that idea from a barista and yeah. then the, and then the franchise owner brings us the, the idea. And then yeah. our team works through it. So much of whether you can roll out a product or not is, is operational. And yeah. you get the product to the stores uh, and, yeah. you know, there's, there's products that are just operationally a nightmare. Yeah. Uh, you know, we did, we did, we did peanut butter for a hot second and, yeah. you know, peanut butter is tough to work with. <laughs> yeah, uh, you sure. know, but so, so, but, but, uh, you know, it, it's really, you know, in a, in a strong, good franchise system, uh, it is yeah. very much a collaboration. Uh, yeah. It's very much a collaboration. For sure. Also kind of bouncing off of that, what do you look for? Um, one bringing on a new franchisee. So who do you look for if they apply? Uh, what does that process kind of look like? And what what is that? Well, you know, again, mixed bag, but but really the number one thing I look for is somebody's got a long-term perspective. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Somebody that is energized and fired up. And, you know, and then somebody that is interested in, having a, a powerful impact in their community. Yeah. And because those are the things that really make the business work. Mm. Uh, and so, you know, I, I'm not, um, but I've been, I've been fooled so many times and, and fooled yeah. in a, in the right way, in the wrong way, you know, I, that, yeah. and, and it's like, it's so hard to predict. It's so yeah. hard to predict who's going to be successful and who isn't. You know, yeah. we've had people come in who who were really powerful in another brand and had a great a lot of success in another brand, and, and then yeah. they, they decide they want to get the coffee, and and then you know it doesn't they don't it doesn't work. Uh, and, and there's always different reasons for why it doesn't work. But then yeah. I've also had people come in where I was worried. I was like, oh my gosh, you know this person, and and next thing you know, they're just they're amazing. And, yeah. And so it's really hard as a franchisor to and i always hear franchisors talking about they've got you know some process they put people through to determine whether or not it's like boy i don't know i i mean um it's really hard to sit with somebody for an hour or two or have them take some test and then predict success yeah that that to me is just um i don't know i think i think they do it because they feel like they should have some explanation around that question you just asked, which sure. is a, which is a pretty important question in franchising. Yeah. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, I've always been worried. I don't want to, I would never want to deny somebody yeah. who, who could come in and surprise us too. And it yeah. happens all the time. You know, yeah. uh, some of our most successful franchisees, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure that if you'd asked me up front that whether I thought they were going to be successful or not, I'm not sure I would have said, yeah, super confident, you know, Yeah. but they come in, man, it just, it's amazing to watch. Mm. Yeah. That's a good point on community uh, driven. I can see how that can have a huge impact on kind of the loyalty they build within like their, re- their region, wherever their location is. I'd love to hear, um, what would you say separates Big B from competitors? I know it's a tough one, especially you have Starbucks at scale. You also have local shops. What would you say? Well, I mean, there's a couple of things. Yeah. One, that operating mechanism, uh, we call it our, our operating, uh, we call it position priorities internally, but but that yeah. that that efficiency of production, uh, how we set up our espresso bar, uh, the efficiency of our of our prioritization tool for our people. I, I would say that differentiates us. Yeah. When you walk into one of our one of our stores and and you start paying attention to what people are doing there's real methodology behind it. Mm. Uh, and, and if you walk into a competitor store, you know, more the, 
the maybe the mom and pop stores and so on. Yeah. There's it's sort of chaos. Yeah. You know, and so that that's a big factor. Another factor is that we came into coffee and we had a really strong commitment to not be intimidating and to be welcoming to everyone. Yeah. And that, you know, you, you stack us up against like Blue Bottle or Starbucks, these pretentious brands. And, mm-hmm. and you know, they've done great. You know, I, I would never knock Starbucks. Holy smokes. The top yeah. five retail rollouts in history. They're amazing, you know. Of course. Uh, but our differentiator on that was is we wanted anyone to feel comfortable walking in. Mm. And we didn't want anybody to feel intimidated. I remember my mom, you know, joking with me back in the day. I mean, here she is. She, she teaches at the university. She's a very, very smart woman. And, mm. and, and she was like, she walked into a coffee shop and she was like, they made me feel like, you know, that I was kind of dumb because I didn't know how to order this or you know, this is back in the nineties, you know, but, yeah. but, you know, it's like that, that whole feel. And so what we've done with our brand is we've really tried to position our brand in between say the one side of the spectrum, which might be, you know, uh, Starbucks and, and, and the higher end sort of boutique cafes. Mm. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have the McDonald's and the Dunkin' Donuts. Yeah. And so what we've tried to do is we've tried to position our, our brand right in between the two of those, mm. our product line, our product line is very, very similar to Starbucks. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, um, but our brand position is much more welcoming. And so you can walk in from Starbucks and you're going to see what you get at Starbucks on our menu. For sure. You'll be able to get that. But then you can also walk in from McDonald's and look up at the menu board and not be intimidated and feel welcome. And so you don't, you know, you, you don't necessarily drink a latte every day. Uh, yeah. You're, you're going to feel good about maybe buy a latte in our store because uh, it's yeah. you know super high energy and super fun. And, and mm. so I would say that's the other piece. The other thing that we have is we've got a really powerful uh, purpose within our organization that, you know, may, maybe isn't differentiating us today. I, yeah. I, I don't, you know, it's hard to quantify that. Yeah. I know give us 10 years. And yeah. I, I know it will absolutely differentiate us. Mm. And so I think that is, I mean, I think it's differentiating us today uh, to some degree, um, yeah. but you know, the purpose we bring to the world and the reason we show up to work in the morning is to support you in building a life that you love. Mm. And that's something we worked on for a very long time. And yeah. it fits really, really well inside of our business model mm. uh, with franchise owners. Uh, and, and then, you know, we also, the way we look at it is if we engage you as an individual in any way, mm-hmm. our, our mission, what we want to do, our purpose is to support you, whoever you are yeah. in building a life that you love. And, mm-hmm. and then that's become this, this, this mantra within our organization. And at the end of the day, I think that that's going to be a, it's just going to be a massive differentiator. Uh, and there's so many really big things going on. Like mm-hmm. I'm launching my second book, on Tuesday. And, wow. um, and it's, it's, it's about the culture of supporting you and building a life that you love, which means Incredible. it's a nurturing, supportive, loving mm. environment. Yeah. When you show, when you show up to work and, and that, that, that's the, it's right here. It's called grow. Um, and, and it's, Maybe. it's, that's the premise of the book. It's all on leadership. And, and uh, you know, I think that that will be a very uh, powerful differentiator as mm. we move forward. Incredible. That's a perfect segue. Uh, I like to conclude each episode with this kind of ties into that. Um, if you can share one piece of advice with an aspiring entrepreneur, maybe something you've learned or regret along the way, what would you say that would be? Focus. Yeah. For a long time. Yeah. I like that. Focus. So, so, you know, I tell people I spent 15 years of my life as a franchise salesman. Yeah. And, and I, and I woke up every single day. I didn't say two years. I didn't say five years. I didn't say five, seven years. I said 15 years. I spent yeah. 15 years of my life where my primary function within the business was to bring people on board and, and, you know, I, I, was, I sold franchises mm. and I didn't do anything else. Yeah. And, and the, the, the bane of the entrepreneur and entrepreneurs sort of wear this like a badge of honor, which yeah. is 
you know, they're always looking for the new thing. And then, and it's like, it's not about the new thing. It's about executing your thing perfectly. Yeah. And people don't, people don't. And I, and I talk, I, I teach a class here at the university and I, I talk about this all the time. It's the, it's the myth of the million dollar idea. Mm. It's not about the idea. It's yeah. not about having the next whatever, you know, insert yeah. whatever. And I mean, sure, those things come along, you know, yeah. but I'm sorry, the Bill Gates and the Steve Jobs and the Elon Musk. I mean, yeah. you're not going to be them. <laughs> like, yeah. You're just not right. Yeah. And so and so then what does it become? Well, it becomes, you know, uh, aligning yourself with with a business and starting a business and then executing focusing mm. and executing and becoming world-class at delivering that product to the marketplace mm. for a long period of time. Mm. Amazing. Well, Mike, thank you so much for joining me. And to the listeners out there, make sure to check out Bigby at bigby.com. And Mike's also his new book. Um, at the time of this episode, you're listening to this, make sure to check it out, grow. Um, the link will be in this description. Yeah, it's uh, michaeljmcfall.com. Awesome. Yeah.